Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce our speaker today. There are really so many things to say about him that I had to write them down. I can't remember them all. Uh, as you all know, he's a professor of psychology at Temple University. He started off, got his Ph.D. at Harvard, working with Dick Ernstein. Uh, since that time, he's taken on many obligations and completed them with great credit. He's been editor of JAB. Uh, he's the past president of this organization, of ABBA. Uh, he's the past president of Division 25 of APA. Uh, he's written, I don't know how many papers, books, articles, chapters. Uh, he wrote a great chapter on uh, avoidance behavior in the second Honig uh, book. Uh, and there was only one person at that time who could have written that chapter, and that was Phil. I know that. And uh, <clears throat> Well, I, I think everybody who's here really know him, and I don't want to take time away from what he has to say. Uh, so I ask you to welcome our old friend, Phil Heinlein. <clears throat> well, my topic for today, as you can see from the title here, is Aversive Events and Behavior. Um, I've been helped out substantially by Matthew Andrzejewski, who will be flipping the transparencies, but it's appropriate that he be in on this especially because he also made quite a number of them. I'm a novice at working with PowerPoint, and uh, he uh, went well beyond that in generating some of the procedural diagrams, which you will see. Okay, let's move to the first or second, second one. First off, aversive events and behavior certainly can be categorized, or traditionally have been anyway, into two general domains. One concerns the domain of punishment, and the other the domain of negative reinforcement. I will only be saying a few things about punishment, um, although the topic certainly is an important one. Uh, the area of negative reinforcement I will break out in a little more detail, as you can see, dealing with frequency versus postponement of events, the roles of added stimuli, and what this has to say more generally about behavioral process, specifically regarding multiple scales of behavioral process. If that seems a little arcane or unfamiliar to you at present, that's the point. I would hope to explain it a little bit before I'm done. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about punishment then. First off, punishment in the vernacular has two meanings, but those two meanings are almost always conflated. And that represents a major problem within behavior analysis because in behavior theory, we have insisted upon just one of those meanings. We've defined it very carefully, but just the same, someone coming from the ordinary language community, whenever you say the word punishment, is actually hearing both meanings. And the, the meaning that I'm most concerned with first here is that of vengeance. Um, Vengeance refers to getting them when they got you. That is, if somebody uh, broke into your house or stole your car, uh, you, you have, you'd like to get the bastard. I mean, that, that's sort of the way we are. Uh, it doesn't even have to be necessarily uh, an interpersonal kind of thing. In my own case, if in the dark of night walking across uh, the bedroom, I hit my shin on a coffee table or something of similar dimensions, I'm, there's some tendency to want to do damage to the wall and to my fist. And we are like that. It is a functional category, I think, and yet we have not really appreciably studied it or acknowledged it. There's been some research on shock elicited aggression, uh, which bears some similarity to what goes on in that kind of circumstance, the reaction to pain, but much of vengeance is not reaction to pain per se. It is reaction to damage done uh, in somewhat more abstract or, or uh, uh, extended ways. Okay, the other then is a contingent consequence that decreases behavior. And of course, this is the definition that behavior analysts are familiar with. Um, the parameters that affect its effectiveness were outlined very nicely by Azrin and Holtz in 1966, a, uh, a book uh, that contains the chapter by Murray Sidman, incidentally, on avoidance, which preceded the one I wrote later. But uh, they essentially 
not only acknowledged that punishment can be very complicated in its effects, they showed you how to analyze that complexity, what are the operative variables, what are the determinants of whether punishment will be effective. Um, a couple other articles are, I think, pertinent here. The one by Van Houten in 1983 uh, appears in a book edited by Axelrod and Apshe. Um, that's on the punishment of human behavior. And what Van Houten achieved was to show that the basic rubric that was laid out by uh, Azrin and Holtz is also valid in addressing human behavior. In the same volume, though, is a chapter by Newsom, Favel, and Rinkover, which is uh, of interest because oftentimes people focus with punishment, or in the case of punishment, focus on its side effects. And we're very concerned that a punishment procedure could have effects that would be deleterious in the long run or sometimes even in the short run. Well, the data don't seem to support that as a major problem for the most point. It's a very plausible story that you would get things such as counter-aggression or imitation or what have you that, that would uh, produce behavior patterns we say we wouldn't like, and yet in the actual cases where it's been used and systematically studied, those have not seemed to be major problems. So I thought that's worth noting. Okay, the, uh, I have only one more transparency on punishment, and that is to make some brief observations. I'm not giving a systematic treatment of the topic, but I think there are two very salient points to be made. First off, as stated in red there near the top, viewing punishment as a fundamental adaptive process is not the same as advocating its use. Now, B.F. Skinner actually modified, even distorted his theory, partly to minimize the likelihood of, of people taking him as advocating it. He said that punishment is only temporary in its effects and perhaps indirect in its effects. Well, that's kind of interesting because reinforcement is also temporary in its effects. That's what we mean by extinction. And so uh, we might as well face the fact that punishment as a process is part of our adaptiveness. If you were to put your hand on a hot stove, get yourself thoroughly singed, and be just as likely to do it again, you are in big trouble. And so punishment in our interaction with the world is certainly important to our coping. On the other hand, um, many behavior problems are mainly behavioral deficits. Uh, it's not unusual for people to say, oh, we need some help here to deal with this behavior problem. When people talk about behavior problems, or behave yourself even from the vernacular, they're talking about somebody doing something that's problematic. And so we've got to come in and get rid of that somehow. And the suggestion would be to use a punishment procedure because you're focusing on some behavior that needs to be decreased. However, even people characterized as sociopathic in many instances are not people who have bizarre reinforcers or urges or what have you. It is that they have learned bizarre ways to produce the consequences that are reinforcing to any of us. That it is attention or affection or what is called on the street respect, I suppose, but it is these same things that would be reinforcers for us that are also for these individuals. The problem is those are the only ways they have to get them. On National Public Radio a few weeks ago, um, there was a story by a woman who had volunteered to help out in her daughter's classroom. And her idea was she would read stories to the children. She could only do this about an hour every other week. And she thought this would not be nice. Her daughter could sit on her lap and it would all be very cozy and whatnot. Well, the teacher gave her a slightly different task. She was given the task of working with the child who just the day before on a field trip to the museum had mooned people with his bare behind out the rear window of the bus. Uh, this uh, child that she was supposed to work with had been to the principal's office any number of times and clearly was a behavior problem, no question. Well, when she started working with this child who was in the late days of the third grade, she discovered this child did not even know the letters of the alphabet. The behavior deficit was that this child's repertoires in included virtually nothing reinforceable by the teacher in the context of that classroom. And people, if they're still alive and healthy, will not stop behaving. And what gets reinforced will be maintained. So that suggests 
an ethical and a practical principle. That is, if punishment is to be implemented in any circumstances, one must always arrange for an alternative reinforced response. Even the Azarin and Holtz article supports this because they showed that the intensity of punishment required to decrease a response is much less if there is an available alternative reinforced response. So for each of these many considerations, uh, it makes sense to arrange an alternative reinforced repertoire, and I would say this has the status of an ethical principle within behavior analysis. So that's essentially all I have to say about punishment in the allotted time, so let's move on to negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is behavior maintained by contingent removal, prevention, or postponement of some event or situation. It's a lot of words, but it's basically fairly straightforward, and I think most everyone here uh, has encountered this definition, probably has taught it to someone else. Um, one thing that's important is to distinguish reinforcer from reinforcement, and this is the same as in positive reinforcement, in that uh, it isn't the thing, it is the process in one case, or a procedure. The behavior produces some change, and we're saying the change is the preventing removal, etc. There's also a consideration as to how this relates to positive reinforcement. Some have argued that it's really an artificial distinction, because always doing one thing could be not doing something else, and presenting one thing could be viewed as the removing of something else, and so why not just try to get it within one system? Well, there's one good reason, and it concerns an asymmetry. That is to say, if the behavior is to produce the removal of something, it has to occur in the presence of that something. And that means if it's a type of event whose removal is likely to be effective in some way, it's an event then whose presence may directly through elicitation perhaps um, also directly affect behavior. And so what you want to reinforce by the removal has to compete with whatever is directly produced by that. Uh, it was illustrated quite nicely by a, an experiment by Keller many years ago um, on escape conditioning using bright light as the aversive stimulus. He wanted to reinforce pressing a lever by turning off the bright light. But of course, the rat put his paws over his eyes instead of pressing the lever. Now, in the case where you're positively reinforcing by delivering food, it's true, the food would directly produce some behavior, namely that of eating, but that doesn't occur at the time when you are essentially trying to induce the behavior to occur and thus reinforce it. Therefore, I think necessarily we are stuck with an asymmetry between positive and negative reinforcement. Okay, this just illustrates something sort of analogous to the fact of punishment being a uh, an basic adaptive process. Uh, the cartoon, in case you can't see it, she's telling him, when you don't hear me criticizing you, that's my way of giving you a compliment. Point is, negative reinforcement, which that that would be a negative reinforcement procedure. She shuts up when he want, occasionally does something right. Um, is going on there, whether it's arranged or not. In fact, those of you who do uh, family therapy or even other kinds of therapy or even try to rearrange your own lives more effectively uh, will discover that people engage in this sort of pattern and are un unable to describe that that is what is going on. But that would be certainly an instance of negative reinforcement. Now we'll get a little more serious. <clears throat> okay, traditionally, avoidance was taken as a separate category of behavior and a special category for theorizing. When I first started out in this a little longer ago than I like to admit, um, it was there was a domain called avoidance theory. And in fact, in the thir learning textbooks now, it still is, by implication, I think, a separate domain for theory and behavior. Um, the notion was that it required some rather special theorizing, and I'll get to that in just a second. It was distinguished, though, from escape. Escape seemed to be rather a straightforward kind of negative reinforcement. That is to say, the reinforcement by the removal of something. And so, if 
there's a splinter in your hand and it really hurts and you find a tweezer, pull it out, you are more likely to do that in the future. There was a change. The splinter in your hand as removed could be seen as a removal of that painful situation. Um, however, avoidance then is contrasted with this as being prevention of events. And so um, the special theorizing comes in because you're saying, well, how can behavior be maintained by something not happening? And avoidance theory can be understood as various inventions, essentially, of plausible ways that you could see the behavior as producing an immediate consequence. That is to say, traditional avoidance theory focuses very exclusively on molecular process. It, reinforcement is construed as having to occur at a moment in time. Um, in addition, warn, uh, avoidance theory, which I will not go into in detail, uh, almost, well, virtually always involved uh, warning stimuli. There are stimuli that precede the event that could be prevented, and responding is effective because it removes that warning stimulus. In effect, I won't go through it in detail because I think it covers only a very small part of what's going on when we speak of avoidance, but basically what they were saying was we do not avoid rain, we only escape from the clouds. And in the laboratory analog of this, we're saying then the rat cannot avoid the shock, he can only turn off the event that precedes the shock. And I would suggest that that's an insult to the complexity of the laboratory rat, let alone to the person. We will see, indeed, the animals can do much better than that. Okay, the question then is, do the warning stimuli make avoidance into escape? I will show you some things later that will make quite clear that that's not usually what is going on. Instead, we need to understand behavior as occurring on extended time scales. That is, behavioral process does not occur just at an instant. Rather, scales of process are something that we need uh, to understand, not only in avoidance theory, but in other domains. But that's a later part of my argument. Okay. First off, what do I mean uh, by extended? Well, I mean events can be viewed as on a continuum. And uh, in this case, we're talking about prevention or removal, and so there is a continuum from frequency reduction to uh, the instantaneous or momentary termination of an event. The, the example, I think, illustrates it quite nicely. A baby shrieks continuously until you feed her. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforward, and in fact, that goes on in many homes all the time. But what if the baby only shrieks once every two seconds? Or what if she shrieks once every five seconds? Or every 30 seconds? Or every 30 minutes? Or every two hours? At what point would your feeding the baby be construed not as terminating the tantrum, but rather as preventing the next shriek? The, you might want to argue that it's at three or four seconds, or someone else might want to say 30 seconds. The point is, the 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 phenomenon is a continuum. It's our description that is converting it into a dichotomy. And so uh, it's true, you will see the parent's behavior changing. They might start feeding, you'd say, before the next tantrum begins. Well, they're avoiding that tantrum, but at what point would you have to talk about it that way? The changing way of talking about it might come through an appeal to added discriminative cues. Uh, and those do play a role, but I'll be talking about those a little bit later. For now, let's begin with a rather pure laboratory case. This is a demonstration of shock frequency reduction uh, as reinforcement. It was um, based upon some experiments, or inspired by some experiments by Murray Sidman, uh, but it was Dick Hernstein and I who did the experiment, basically, I was a graduate student. He came up with the idea. I did most of the work. Uh, standard operating procedure. Um, we are the, uh, I wrote the procedures and the method, proce method section. We haggled quite a bit over the introduction. Uh, the discussion appeared miraculously one morning. I sort of nibbled around the edges of it a little bit, but it came to be known as Hernstein and Heinlein 1966, which does appear in most of the learning texts. Let me describe that procedure to you. Um, it turns out it's not all that easy to arrange for events to occur randomly in time. 
what we used was a paper tape that had two potential rows of holes in it, or rows of potential holes, whichever you like. And this tape would step every two seconds. And in one of the rows, the probability of a hole was 0.3 at each step. That comes out to an average of a hole coming up about every nine seconds. But there could be two in a row, or they could be spaced out. The other one had a probability of 0.1, so one in 10, so that's one per 20 seconds, because it's stepping every two seconds. Now, as shown here, these are just holes in, the row, uh, uh, in, in rows on this tape. The next slide shows what happens if we put it into the avoidance procedure. Uh, this was an experiment with laboratory rats, and they are in a chamber, one at a time. A chamber has a lever in it, and if the rat does nothing, uh, he's standing on a grid floor, and there are very brief shocks delivered when these holes come up in the tape. They're a third of a second and eight-tenths of a milliamp. Uh, as experimenter, I felt duty-bound to occasionally put my hand down there in the grid, partly to see if it was still working, but also to see that it was um, not more intense than it needed to be. It was not pleasant, but it also didn't do any damage. Anyway, if the animal did not press the lever, then the holes on that upper row, the one with the probability of 0.3, result in brief shocks, which we now represent with a little splash uh, with jagged edges, which portrays it quite well, I think. If the animal does respond, it transfers the control of shock to the other row until a shock occurs and then it comes back again. So here he hasn't responded yet. There are two shocks being delivered. Here you see a response occurs and it came after this hole was punched. So there are no shocks. He's thus removed those two, but one does come up here and so control comes back to here. He takes two shocks before he responds again and so it goes. If he had responded right here, it would have resulted, even though the overall probability is quite low, it would have resulted in the immediate shock and it would have been right back where he started. And in fact, that did sometimes happen. On the other hand, there were times when you got lucky uh, on the one that was more dense because there were periods uh, where it came up with quite a few consecutive holes uh, or steps without holes. The um, result of this procedure was very reliable acquisition. Uh, the animals, 17 out of 18 animals, acquired uh, quite quickly on this procedure and uh, responded very persistently. We studied it systematically with differing probabilities and so forth. There are no added warning stimuli or anything like that. Uh, and so we argued that what, what's going on here was reinforcement by the reduction in the shock frequency. They could not avoid a particular shock. Okay, let's... Uh, Go back, this just is the slide that introduced this sequence. So this is the one that I just described. There were several people who argued that you could still preserve this as contiguous consequences. Jim Dinsmore is probably the most prominent of those people uh, since he's uh, incapacitated with a broken leg right now. I'm a little ambivalent about using him as my opponent, but uh, the, um, he argued that what's going on here is the average time from a response to a shock is shorter than the average time between shocks. And so that would mean then that you have a shorter delay, and for him that's converting it to sort of a, an immediate consequence of the behavior. The problem is that these are distributions. And so uh, we're talking about average, but average of something that varies quite widely. Uh, it is true those two averages differ, but it's also true that the average time between shocks is simply the reciprocal of the shock frequency. And the average time from a response to a shock is simply the mathematical reciprocal of the uh, shock frequency in the post-response period. So in terms of any formal analysis of this, you gain absolutely nothing. It does sort of show a little bit, though, this tendency toward a preference for, for molecular interpretations in avoidance theory because somehow it seemed to the people favoring this approach seemed that the um, that this averaging of delays was somehow ought to be easier for the animal to do than somehow computing frequencies. But I think it's a mistake to assume 
anything much about how the organism does something like that. Because, in fact, there are lots of easy ways to integrate events over time. Um, a brick can integrate shocks over time. A brick, if you soak it, it's got, uh, so it's damp, it will conduct electricity a little bit. You'll be passing electrical current through a resistance. It has a rate of heat dissipation, and so the temperature of the brick will be monotonically related to the shock frequency. And that doesn't even have a nervous system. So um, I would not assume uh, too much on the basis of how you think the organism does it. The big mistake in avoidance theory was they were very, very preoccupied with how the organism does what it does before they had the foggiest notion of what it was capable of doing. Okay, end of that sermon. Now, um, there also have been experiments with ex temporally extended contingencies uh, that would be less easy to interpret in terms of these short-term delays. And with characteristic modesty, I'll include another one from our own laboratory. This is by Mellitz and Lawrence and somebody, White House, yes, White House and myself. Um, in this procedure, uh, laboratory rat had access to two response levers, each of which would do exactly the same thing. That is, they could avoid by Sidman's type of procedure, which I'll describe in a few minutes, but uh, we initially had just the right lever in for a day, then the left lever for a day, then the right lever for a day, and indeed we got responding on both of those levers avoiding shock. Then we put both levers in at the same time, but they operated in such a way that the shock postponement system uh, worked identically no matter which one was pressed. So it was just um, gave him two alternatives to do the same thing. Each animal had a preferred lever, and so you, we took the one that was less preferred and we added a conjoint contingency to that one. That is to say, each press on the non-preferred lever could subtract a minute from the avoidance session until you got within two minutes of the end of the session, and then we disabled it. We didn't want them to be able to produce the immediate consequence of the end of a session. And what we found was each animal subjected to this procedure shifted over to responding on what had been the non-preferred lever. And then we reversed it, and we reversed it again, and reversed it again. So showed pretty conclusively that at least where they pressed was sensitive to this rather long-term consequence, uh, especially in the, the early parts of the session. You're talking about something that's happening more than an hour from now uh, was, part, was the consequence of that response. So let's move on and see what's next here. Okay. We, I felt we had uh, pretty conclusively shown shock frequency reduction as sufficient to maintain what might be called avoidance. Um, on the other hand, it was quite possible that there is also short-term postponement that would be an effective consequence. Now, Sidman's procedure, 1953, which I will show you in a, in a minute, combines both of these. The, at the time when it was first done, Sidman's procedure was important because it got rid of the warning stimuli and whatnot, which I'll be talking about later. Um, but uh, he did not isolate then the, the short-term postponement aspect from the overall shock frequency. I then did a uh, follow-up experiment that did dissociate these, those two things. So that's the sequence that we will look at at this point. This also is to introduce you to this kind of diagram. Time, as you know, goes from left to right, and in the convention here, it's indicated by the solid black arrow. And if a shock occurs, there's an instantaneous change back to the beginning, and the, so these blue line, uh, blue arrows indicate instantaneous change. The brackets show the times during which a response could be effective, and this is still a chamber with a lever in it. So a lever press is the response, and a response produces a shift back to the beginning. Anywhere along here, a response starts back to the beginning. So if it occurs early, it's just a short reset, and on that way. If this were a 20-second interval, any response at l no more than 19 and a half seconds or 19.9 seconds since the preceding one would prevent the shock and start this timing cycle over. It's a little bit like uh, depositing coins in a parking meter, especially the kind in front of the post office that, you know, one coin takes it to the maximum, and so there's no point in putting in extra coins, but any time you put in a coin, it starts the timing uh, to the maximum value. Okay, 
Moving to the next one, we have a slightly more complicated version of Sidman's procedure, but it's essentially the same thing. If there's no response, you have time passing, a shock occurs, it starts over, a shock occurs, it starts over, and this is called the shock-shock interval, time between shocks. Logical enough. Any response, though, resets it back to here. That is to say, the response-shock interval is typically longer than the shock-shock interval. And so a response anywhere in here can prevent the shock, but if he takes a shock, he's back potentially in the shock-shock interval. And normally, uh, as I said, this is shorter than this one. You can actually, once responding has been established, you can make this one shorter down to about half the length of this. Response rates will increase as the response shock interval gets shorter uh, until you get to those very short values. And, um, but normally, and especially for acquisition, you would have the response shock interval longer than the shock shock interval. Okay, moving on to the next thing. Uh, I guess I should point out, yes, Sidman's procedure did maintain responding. We wouldn't be very interested in it if it hadn't. Uh, and as noted, a response not only postponed shock, but it also reduced the number of shocks per minute, that is to say, the shock frequency. Okay, fiddling with these procedures, along with some other things we were doing, I came up with this procedure, which allows for the postponement of shock, but keeps the shock frequency constant. So, if there's no response, it's as a little bit diff well, as before in some respects, the difference is there's now a retracting lever. I spent about four months building a lever that would retract in a tenth of a second. And so the lever is in the chamber during the time as uh, indicated in gray here. A shock occurs at the eighth second, and then the lever goes out at the tenth, and then at the twentieth second you would start over. The lever would come back in again. So eight seconds with the lever in, then a shock, lever out at 10, the remainder of the 20, and start over. And if he does not press the lever, that's what happens. However, any time he responds, the lever retracts. The shock at the 8th second is canceled. However, there will be a shock at the 18th second. So there is still one shock per 20 seconds. However, he can postpone it from somewhere in here out to the 18th second. And then, of course, it starts over with the lever in. Uh, some of you are wondering, what if he responds at the ninth second? That would result in two shocks in that cycle. Uh, they did that a few times, but not very many. Uh, and so that would produce a shock frequency increase, and they did show us that they were sensitive uh, to that as a, probably a punishing consequence. The um, next procedure, oh, and responding was very readily maintained in animals on that procedure. Now, in the next one, if he doesn't respond, it's just the same as before. Eight seconds to a shock, lever out at 10, start over at 20. If he responds, he cancels that shock as before, but now he drives the lever out for only 10 seconds, and a shock will occur eight seconds after that response, whenever it occurred. The result of this, then, is there is still one shock per cycle. He still postponed that shock, but he shortened the cycle. That means more cycles per minute, or per hour at least, and then that means a higher shock frequency. The animals subjected to this procedure did not respond, and those that had been moved from the other procedure to this one quit responding. So this suggested then that these two variables can be pitted against each other. You can have short-term postponement, or overall shock frequency change, and this compares the two. Here you can have postponement with no change in shock frequency, and this maintains the responding. On the other hand, if you then put them on this one, where they can still postpone the shock, not as much, but also raising their shock frequency, then they quit responding. Now this uh, was the first instance in which this kind of dissociation was achieved. Something else that was going on in uh, the same laboratories at the time uh, related to what we now call self-control, the pitting of short-term against long-term consequences. And as you see, this is the beginnings of looking at appetitive and aversive behavior in similar ways, or that, that particular thing. Um, I will show you at the very end of the hour uh, some procedures that are more sophisticated than these or uh, accomplish greater ranges of change 
than these. But this was the first one that kind of showed you can do it, that, that you can break apart this normal redundant relation between short-term postponement and long-term consequence. Back to the notes, I think, is a prompt for uh, just an example that's analogous to the two procedures I just described. Uh, the first one, where the frequency stays constant, is a little bit like postponing the payment of your income tax. You pay your income tax every year, but um, you can postpone it from April until October or something of that sort. Now, the alternative would be like the last one that I did, would be you could postpone paying your income tax by as much as three months, but the next tax year would start five months from the date at which you submitted your payment. So if you consider uh, the normal due date is in April, and so you postpone it for a month, so that gets you to May, uh, that's fine. You had that month. However, your new tax year will start in October, which is to say your, uh, you paid tax on one year, uh, actually on the basis of a 10-month period, but you paid a year's worth of taxes, and then you continue on. So that would be the nature of the increase being of the long term being pitted against the postponement in the short term. Okay. The newsworthy thing about Sidman's procedure back when he first published it in 1953 was uh, that avoidance theorists prior to this had viewed warning stimuli as necessary for avoidance. All avoidance procedures used warning stimuli. The assumption was the animals needed it. Of course, it was the theorists that needed it rather than the animals. As I also said earlier, figuratively, it's, as we've noted, the organism uh, was avoiding rain by escaping from clouds. Okay, ironically, it was Sidman's own laboratory and then and also some work by a few other people that showed what the warning stimuli are mainly doing by putting them into the procedure where they're not needed. Prior to that, the procedure didn't work if there wasn't a warning stimulus in it. Well, his procedure showed the animals will postpone shocks whether or not, uh, or without a warning stimulus. Let's see what happens uh, when you simply add a warning stimulus. So it's the same kind of diagram you've had before. Uh, time passes. Let's consider this a 20-second interval. At 15 seconds, a light comes on, and then a shock at the 20th, and you start over. And the same thing happens again. I should make it that way for starting over. A response anywhere within this bracket, just as before, can start things over. So if the response occurs before the light comes on, it prevents it. If the light has come on before the response occurs, then it terminates the light, but it still prevents the shock. So it's the same procedure as before, but just laying that five-second stimulus on the top of it, so to speak. Okay, animals responded on this very nicely. However, what they did was they waited, and they virtually always responded during the light. We'd always uh, already seen they were capable of responding out in here, but very consistently they waited till here. So then there's this experiment by Ulrich Holtz and Azrin uh, some years later, which just verifies that even if you crank up the heat a little bit on the warning stimulus, it doesn't make very much difference. This is the same procedure as before in terms of responding, and the uh, light comes on five seconds before the shock is due, but now if they take the shock and don't respond, the shocks will occur once every five seconds and the light stays on continuously. At the same time, a response at any time can put them out here, and they could stay out here, they could keep the light off. Uh, instead, once again, what they do is they respond primarily in the presence of that light. You might have thought, well, they're just somehow incapable of, you know, even though when there were no warning stimuli there, now somehow this is, has handicapped them. Well, if you now set it up so it's exactly the same, but responses are only effective here, now they will respond here. And so what you have to get a little ahead of the game is this is an SD, S-delta discrimination. That is, this is S-delta because when the light is on, responses are ineffective. They quit responding in the presence of the light. Now, this is the only time when responses are effective, and indeed, they do come to respond during that period, and we call that the response light interval. It's the amount of time by which a response can postpone the onset of the light. There was um, an additional 
experiment, uh, which is not noted here. Uh, I think I put it in the notes that I distributed to people yesterday. Um, by Field and Boren. Uh, Field and Boren asked, well, maybe it's just somehow the task has been made more difficult, so let's give them warning stimuli for warning stimuli for warning stimuli. And there are strings of 10 stimuli with shock coming only at the end, and the animals responding could sort of increment the distance away and make it very dis discriminable. And in fact, that just confirmed this story. The more discriminable you make the proximity to the shock, the closer they will ride to it. It's a little bit like if you were going to cross an interstate highway with your eyes closed. Uh, you would probably wait until you couldn't hear any cars at all, right? But if you can see, then in fact you will allow the cars to be much closer as you n navigate among them. Uh, it's a little bit similar in this respect. The story that you're going to see is that the role of these added stimuli then is primarily discriminative. But there's an interesting story that goes along with that. The key experiment for this was an experiment by Sidman and Boren in 1957. And in my view, this experiment is the most important single experiment on avoidance conditioning that's ever been done. It was done 40 years ago. It does not appear in the textbooks on learning for the most part. The story that comes out of that experiment essentially makes trivial the avoidance theory that is still described in most textbooks of learning. Because it will portray some relationships that are closer, I think, to what goes on when we speak of avoidance in everyday events, and yet it deals with relationships that traditional avoidance theory is simply totally silent on, has, has nothing to say about. So, to get ahead of this, the game, it's a little bit complicated, so I'm sort of going to tell you what I'm going to do, then I'll do it, and then I'll tell you what I did. Um, and we're going to find, we're going to start talking about situations now. We're starting to move toward larger scales of process. And so, the relative aversiveness of a situation, that is to say, aversiveness means whereby getting out of that situation is a reinforcing consequence is only partly dependent on the events that occur within that situation. The additional contributors are the contingencies or the work requirements within that situation, the work requirements or contingencies in alternative situations, and then the contingencies regarding access to alternatives. That is to say, what's involved in getting from one situation to another. So now let's look at this procedure. This is one uh, before we did these color-coded diagrams. I've described this in colloquia from time to time, and I think I get it right about a third of the time. So I'm hoping it will go a little better here. Um, OK, you have been introduced to all of the elements of the diagram in terms of how it works. Once again, if the animal does not respond, time moves from left to right. This could be typically 20 seconds. Let's make it this time. Uh, this could be 10 seconds, but that's, that was studied parametrically. Uh, but let's say for 20 seconds, then the light comes on for 10 seconds, then a shock occurs, and you start over, instantaneous change. 20 seconds here, then 10 seconds with the light on, shock occurs, and start over. Now, what's different from before is the consequences. If a response occurs during this first period, the response light interval, it starts it over and prevents the light. You've already seen that before. The one difference is what happens out here. If he allows the light to come on, he can still postpone the shock, but he can only reset the timer to the beginning of this interval. So if this was a 10-second period, then he's in a 10-second response shock interval here. If this is a 20-second period, he's in a 20-second response light interval. That's time from a response till the onset of the light. So he could bail out here and simply stay out in this region. He could let this come on, but if he comes, lets this come on, he must respond in this situation with the light on. The only way he can get out of it is by taking a shock, which gets him back to the beginning. So now let's see what happened on that procedure. Oh, I for <laughs> forgot what I should do. Put the other one on first. In the experiment, they now manipulated the relative durations of these two intervals. And in fact, the, which one is kept constant? Uh, it says there, yeah, 
Okay, this one is kept constant at 10 seconds, while this one is manipulated from 10, which would have it equal to this one, to 15 to 20. And what you're seeing here is the thing at 20. Okay. All right. Uh, responding in the dark, that would be in the uh, response light interval. This is responding during the interval where he can prevent the light from coming on. If uh, the two intervals are equal, his response rate is virtually zero. Well, it's a little below one response per minute in the dark. Response is very high during the light. So if those two intervals are equal, he spends his time in the situation closer to the shock. And there are other experiments that are analogous to this where that finding has been replicated over again. Um, if now we make the response light interval longer, that is, each response in the dark buys him more time he actually speeds up. Now that's interesting because in the earlier stuff, which I didn't tell you about, but in the Sidman, uh, Sidman procedures by themselves, if you make the response shock interval longer, they slow down. Responses don't have to occur as quickly. But here, even though the contingency has become less stringent in the dark, they're actually speeding up, and here as well. But the most important finding is what goes on during the light. Remember, that's being held constant. As the response light interval in the dark gets longer, allowing for lower and lower response rates in the dark, even though he responds faster as, they, as he could respond slower, in the light where it's constant, the conditions are constant, he's slowing down. And so at this point, he's responding less than two times per minute. That is to say, he is frequently waiting out the light, taking the shock, which puts him back, back in the situa situation where he can respond more slowly. Now, I know this is complicated, so we're going to go through it one more time. Here's the diagram. This is the interval that was manipulated from 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, so 10, 15, and 20 seconds. Responding during this period is shown in the dark. So as this gets longer, the response rate actually increases. Counterintuitive, because the response contingency is less stringent, and yet he responds more rapidly. Most interestingly, the red is coded so that we see responding here, where the situation is constant, that is, nothing's changing here, this is where you get the greatest change in behavior. So the biggest change in behavior occurs as a result of something occurring somewhere else. Thus, I think if we go back to that other overhead, do we have uh, another version of it? Um, no, the one, the one with text. Uh, you have to go back about five steps, or, or is it there? Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, repeating now what this has shown. The relative aversiveness of those two situations, of being in the light or being in the dark, is only partly dependent on relation to the shock per se. Rather, the contingencies within the situation, that is, how rapidly do you have to respond within that situation, relative to how rapidly you would have to respond in the alternative situations in relation to what's involved in getting access to those alternatives, getting from one to the other. Uh, Sidman and Bourne actually ran a control procedure whereby if the animal let the light come on, he was stuck with that and the response shock interval for five minutes. Then the animal would spend all of his time out here no matter what. So. The, the very fact of being able to get over here by taking a shock affected how rapidly he responded in this situation. And yet those shocks were the very same ones that he could postpone more easily out here. So it wasn't as if, you know, you could take a gentle one to avoid the stiffer ones later. Uh, it was always the same shock. So, um, this... Uh, suggest then we need to think more about situations and situational change, which means we have to look at more extended timescales. One thing that affects, though, how uh, those extended timescales work is the role of added stimuli uh, that might be superimposed. So once again, this role of warning stimuli is quite different from it being a surrogate for the shock itself or something. Um, rather, the uh, superimposed stimuli seem to enable behavioral process 
to work in somewhat different ways. It allows different time periods to function as integral situations. Um, I had promised earlier that I would uh, mention some more sophisticated work than the early stuff that I did, and so there are two examples here, actually three. One is by Gar Gardner and Lewis, who actually followed up on the stuff I had done with shock postponement, and uh, what they did was to work with much wider ranges of postponement as well as wider ranges of shock frequency. This is a slide produced in the old-fashioned way, uh, Xerox out of a journal, so let me explain it to you. Uh, here we have the procedure, time running down here, and if the animal did not respond, the shocks occur on the average of one every 30 seconds. However, um, they are more or less randomly distributed. A response produces a three-minute period with a light on, a, a distinctive stimulus. And now, the same number of shocks, that is six on average, that would have occurred during that three-minute period, now all occur bunched together. But for three groups of animals, they get three different treatments, as it were. For one group, those six shocks come right away. For another group, they come out in the middle. And for the third group, they come out near the end. And now, if you look at the data, these are the ones for which the shocks that came right away. These are the ones for which they came halfway out, 90 seconds away, roughly. Actually, 80, 88 seconds to the first shock. And then these are the ones who could postpone the shock 165 seconds, which is almost to the end of the interval. And so, um, whereas I was working with, well, we can get them to respond based on pushing that shock back six or seven seconds, they were working with these longer time intervals, and it was the adding of superimposed stimuli that enabled that procedure to work. They want, went on and did some other things in which they actually had the frequencies change so the animal could postpone the shocks by, let's say, three or four minutes, but they would take three times as many, so they'd get 18 instead of six. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, they got very nice systematic results in which you would trade off the short-term postponement against the overall frequency. So it's not an either-or sort of question, and that, too, was the way early avoidance theorists tended to operate. If my, my theory is right, your theory is wrong. But what they are is two different operative variables, two different scales of process going on at the same time. Okay, the next experiment illustrates that more neatly, and that's by Perone and Galizio. Uh, so let's go straight to that one. I won't use a procedure diagram here, but I can describe it quite well. Uh, what they did was to first put in place a Sidman-type avoidance procedure. The animal can postpone shocks on one lever. They then introduced timeout periods non-contingently. From time to time, a light comes on, let's say, for five minutes, and the whole thing is suspended. No shocks. I believe the lever was even retracted on this procedure. I know on at least some of them it was. Um, and so they carry that on for a while, and they find, okay, the animals don't respond during that time. Well, they couldn't. The lever's out, okay? But now what they do is bring that lever in, but bring another one in as well, and responding on the second lever can occasionally produce that timeout on this one. So responding on this one can postpone the shocks, Responding on this one, operating through a variable interval schedule, we're getting now to something much more like what we do with positive reinforcement. From time to time, a response here can produce the timeout from responding over here. And this is actually a slight butcher job done on one of their figures, uh, just showing, without the control conditions that would make it a little harder for you to quickly discern, showing the development of a discrimination. You have now, let's say, uh, VI with in silence and VI with a tone, remember it's a light that accompanies the timeout, uh, and we find they respond perfectly well, comparable rates during both of these. If you now put extinction in place, let's say during the tone, responding decreases during that period while it continues in the presence of that. So you have an SDS delta discrimination on this responding maintained by timeout, while meanwhile, any time that it's time in, the avoidance procedure is in effect, and they measured those response rates as well. Now, if we go to the next figure, there's a few years later an experiment by um, Galizio, Robinson, and Ordino, I guess, Odrano. Anyone know how to pronounce his name? Um, the, this uh, summarizes several experiments done with uh, opioid 
uh, with o morphine or opioid agonists. And what they did was to use that very same type of procedure, that is, response rates, not an SDS delta, but just response rates on the timeout lever as opposed to response rates on the lever that directly avoided shocks. And they simply measured responding on those two, normalized to a percentage. So what's the percent of baseline as a function of dosage of a drug with four different drugs? And what they found was as the drug dosage increased, the shock postponement responding was relatively unaffected, whereas the responding on the timeout lever was wiped out at the larger levels. Now, uh, for one thing, if you think of uh, opioid drugs as primarily having a pain-inhibiting effect, you would have thought it probably ought to be the other way around. Uh, but instead, it's the behavior that's more remotely related to the shocks that is more easily disrupted by the drugs. The key thing, the thing that whatever interpretation you choose that I think is incontrovertible, is this shows you that here we have behavioral process definitely occurring on two different time scales. They're related to some degree because what's being, what's maintaining the timeout responding is this, uh, well, if, if the animal had a vocabulary, it would be described in four-letter words, you know, this, this uh, unpleasant uh, procedure, and yet uh, the response that terminates that is, uh, or that, that suspends it, is apparently maintained by a somewhat independent process. So the two are somewhat linked, but they're going on at the same time and clearly can be dissociated. So these illustrate, I think, a number of things. Uh, one, that you see, as we come to understand these processes better, the, th the questions we start asking about them make the issues of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement somewhat more similar. And for me, in fact, the, the issues that followed from that short-term postponement versus overall shock frequency are very much the same ones of the self-control type of studies in positive reinforcement. And so the issue is, what is the scale of process over time that we're dealing with, and what is it that determines the differing scale of process over time? So I will end with a r rather abstract illustration, purely metaphor here, which suggests a role of added stimuli in behavioral process. What we have here is simply a page of dots. Surprise. Uh, they were generated by actually having a probability of a, of a dot occurring be the same for any column vertically, but to have that probability slowly decrease as we move from left to right. And so what you see there, I hope, is just sort of a graded set of dots where they're becoming less and less dense as you move from left to right. Okay, now all we did, this is a high-tech experiment, we Xeroxed that set of dots. So these are actually identical. If you want to look, you know, there's four and then a single, there's four and a single, and so forth. But in addition, just took an ink pen and drew a line here or drew a line here. And what I hope you see is that now you have a dense area and a sparse area. And now here you have a dense area and a sparse area. And the delineation between those two is determined by where the line is drawn. Now, what would this have to do with behavior? Well, I'm suggesting that how events get integrated over time, get grouped over time, is affected then by accompanying stimuli, accompanying events. One rather long-scale version that occurs to me is, uh, relates to the common cold. As you may know, uh, there are roughly 100 viruses that give us what we call colds, and the, the number keeps changing a little because of mutations and whatnot, but roughly 100. And in fact, during your lifetime, you get one, you now become immune to that one. You won't get that one again. You get another one, of course, and another and another, but you're becoming immune to them. But as you get older, there are fewer left for you to catch. On the other hand, it's a sort of a random walk process. These things come through. We inhale them uh, pretty frequently, I imagine. And uh, so there's a fairly constant decrease in frequency with which you, you get colds. Well, at the age of, what, I guess about 29, 30 years old, I moved from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia. And it seems to me very much as if I was always getting colds down in Washington, and I very seldom got them in Philadelphia. That is to say, what was probably going on 
was a graded change in the frequency with which I got colds, but there was a salient stimulus that divided those two time intervals, and I reacted to it as two different situations. We've seen then also situations as superimposed on procedures that enable us to dissociate short-term from long-term consequences and the like. Um, I think this issue of understanding process as extended in time is one of the major challenges for contemporary behavioral theory. I think we need to get to the point where we sort of understand it intuitively as well as formally. Uh, if we were working in the domain of geometry uh, or of spatial relations, the fact that you look at a substance under one magnification with a microscope and then a different magnification, and then a different one, you might see very differing patterns. You wouldn't really even know it was the same substance in these cases. But not for a moment would you suggest that one organization had disappeared or ceased to exist just because you're looking at a different one. And yet that's exactly what we do when we're dealing with the time scale. And I think what we need to learn to do is to understand behavior as ongoing in time with the process occurring on small scales and large scales simultaneously. That, the forced recognition of that, I think, came from the puzzles that began with avoidance theory. I think they now uh, confront us as interesting questions in behavior theory more generally. Thank you very much.